morning all I have a very exciting game to show you again of Mikhail Tal so his opponent here was Janis Klavins who was a Latvian champion himself and I'll get you the exact year it's 1952 but there's an article on wiki about him uh, he actually did really well in many of the Latvian championships and, and other tournaments so great player and apparently he went into physics later which ended his career as a chess player he started this new career in physics but uh, for a while he was, he was a really great player with great achievements let's have a look at this game so e4 against Mikhail Tal Tal plays the Sicilian defense we get an open Sicilian Nidorf we have Bishop g5 so f4 here Bishop e7 Queen f3 it looks fairly standard stuff so far Queen c7 white castles queenside yeah this looks entirely like main line ish uh, 9 bd7 knight bd7 Bishop e2 now Tal kicks this Bishop Bishop drops back here and perhaps a slightly provocative move b5 because remember this this rook is subject to attention on e5 but Tal is expecting that Bishop b7 will be sufficient after e5 yes with two pieces attacked Bishop b7 seems good and sufficient and guess what Janice Clavins plays here if I give you five seconds to pause the video what would you play here for white and it's actually one of the better moves in the possession this is actually one of the strongest moves in the possession available okay a razor sharp move offering the Queen yes Tal is playing someone who's playing like Tal or maybe it was the case that the Latvian chess players were kind of attacking aggressive in style maybe it was like a culture of Latvian chess generally as a generalization so a Queen sack offered but what else you know if the Queen had moved here black stands slightly better actually for example like this loses a center pawn better would be f5 here but even here you know black can end up standing better basically so the queen sack is actually a very interesting follow-up so bishop takes f3 and the point is here the bishop is recharging the threat renewing the threats on the rook so we still have two pieces attacked so white's already won a bit of material uh, for the queen we have bishop takes f6 bishop takes f6 so for the moment the dynamic here is three pieces for the queen three minor pieces for the queen if we factor out the knights and the two rooks now here with the rook attacked it goes to c8 which is very strong actually because now there's always the idea of b4 and potentially on c2 at the moment the knights defending c2 but actually it turns out here actually maybe slightly more accurate would have been knight takes f6 offering an exchange sack this position is very interesting for black because there's still pressure on c2 here with the other rook supporting the queen and in fact this can start to get very dangerous for white as this variation shows just tactically and everything it's very dangerous there's a misplaced knight over here this this kind of thing yeah it show, shows if the queens end up there you know e freeze loose so that kind of thing maybe it it's actually an improvement to sack the exchange uh, with knight takes f6 but uh, Tal played rook c8 we have bishop takes g7 and now to hold the h6 pawn we have this awkward looking rook h7 I always look as crazy in this game we got three pieces for the queen and Tal's playing rook moves like this uh, and now <laughs> the amazing thing is white again plays really a great move a fantastic move which 
is really dangerous for black's position can you guess what white played i know this is really weird asking you to guess the moves of tal tal's opponents but credit where credit's due as they say white to play here five seconds Okay, bishop h5, yes, making the rook uh, less tempting now because of this knight e6. But Tal plays it anyway. Knight takes e6, four king, queen, and rook. Queen c4. Which is a strong move. Uh, the queen can't be easily kicked away because of the c3 knight. And Tal's point here is that knight takes g7 isn't that good this wasn't played actually because here we end up losing the knight and that's not that great for white but again the opponent plays a really good move it has to be said what does white play here do you think so i've ruled that out for you as a clue what would you play with white White just supports his rook. White has played this game beautifully. Absolutely beautifully thus far. No wonder he was Latvian champion a few years back. This guy is a brilliant player He's from this from the evidence of this game so far. Uh, so we have here Rook takes g2. Unfortunately now, White plays his first mistake. Rook takes g2 isn't it does have a major downside it is actually a loose piece now in the position although it looks at c2 and everything seems to look at c2 all of black's major resources that he has left but there is a downside this is a potentially vulnerable piece unfortunately white stumbles here quite badly white plays the move rook takes d6 at move 20. okay it's time for tal to roll his sleeves up and I've rolled my sleeves up now for this part of the commentary. We're going to start doing guess the move from Tal's perspective. We see Tal starts uh, waking up and playing super well now. In response to this rook takes d6, there's a flaw. There's a slight flaw which gives a small window of opportunity to Mikhail Tal. But he has to play the right move here. Guess what Tal played? If I give you five seconds, yes. The guess the move is switched now to Mikhail Tal. Black to play. It looks like a ferociously dangerous position with great compensation for the Queen. More than enough on the surface. But here, Black has a move. Five seconds to pause the video. Black to play. Okay, an unpinning tactic. It unpins. Meaning, actually, it, it creates the threat of f takes e6. Also, king takes d6. So it's actually a double attack. It's actually a fork in a way. Well, a double attack. So there's no useful discovered check here, it seems, for the knight without losing the rook. We can't win the queen. So white uh, plays rook d4. Now, before we go on to this, after queen takes e6, it isn't so rosy for white. He's basically... Uh, not doing that great anymore he's like the exchange down two rooks um sorry rook knight bishop against two rooks and knight he's essentially going to be the exchange down now before we move on to that instead of rook takes d6 white's game could have brilliantly been followed up with rook d4 here there aren't too many places for the queen so queen c6 and then we have bishop f3 hitting that loose rook and white's basically forced to play queen takes f3 because uh, otherwise just dropping the rook knight g5 discovered check queen e2 say and white ends up in this position where white would actually be better after the smoke clears here for example like this white's doing very well still got an advantage he's got potentially uh, an outside pass pawn he's an extra pawn up 
alas, a, an otherwise flawless game up to move 20. An absolutely you know, flawless game. Uh, rook takes g2, yeah. It could have been punished with this rook d4. It's a very precise move to try and punish the rook, basically. But uh, this 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 is a shocking move, I guess. To Maybe, you know, why I got overexcited about it. It's a simple king e7. In retrospect, when you see it, king e7 is an unpinning tactic, yeah. So white must have been taken aback here with king e7. I think this was unexpected. He retreats the rook to attack the queen here, but with the pawn being unpinned, now Tao has available. Can you guess? Yep, queen takes e6. This isn't so rosy for white anymore. Knight d5 check is played. If white had played rook takes e6, f takes black is just better here. He's the exchange up. So we have knight d5 check. King f8. Now white takes the queen. What does Tal play here? Another very precise move. Which on the surface might look silly actually. So if I give you five seconds, what would you play with black in this position? Okay, rook c takes c2 check. Now, the reason I say that looks silly, because if the king moves, haven't we got knight e3 forking the rooks? So the king moves, but guess what Tao has play, has here. So black to play, does he want to just take this rook? Hmm. Or do something else? If I give you five seconds here, what does Tao play here? No, you're not obliged to recapture. It's not a mandatory forcing move to recapture you know, an entire rook. When you can actually play rook takes b2 here, instead threatening mate in one, it's the strongest move. There's no useful checks for this extra rook here, it seems. White plays rook e2. This is essentially losing the rook because after rook b rook g1 check pardon me rook g1 check it forces that rook back and now we win that rook anyway under more favorable circumstances than before than if we're just simply taking it on e6 so now the smoke's clearing tau is the exchange up what happens now knight e3 hitting the knight the knight goes to b6 and it looks in principle as though that might be pegged on c4 or a4 at some point and in fact after rook d6 can you see what tau plays here great move five seconds yep rook takes e3 white's just walked into a nasty fork this is a vicious part of the game with Black's uh, stamping his authority all of a sudden. If check here, then we have rookie eight. So White's forced to simplify. But, okay, after knight c4 check, king f2, knight takes d6. This is, this is now, isn't it still a little bit tricky, this ending? Well, actually, Black's got a two to one pawn majority. What he does is knight e4. So as though the knight's going to c3 soon. Knight c3 hitting a2. White counters. We have a5. Bishop a6. b4. Bishop comes to protect the pawn. a4. And there's a point to this. The king is not used here for a moment. Because now, guess what Tal plays here? Yeah, this is a brilliant... Tal's taken over the second half of the game, like in a football match, like when one side plays brilliantly in the second half. What does black play here?
Yeah, knight takes a2. These pawns are rolling. It can't be taken because b3 and a3 is winning because of a2. It cannot be taken. So white plays king e3. Knight c3. King tries to come to the rescue, but now the black king steps up. Bishop a6. King comes up. White wanted to use that c4 square for the king here. a3. Yeah. King c5. And it's not really possible to play a move like bishop c4 now. If white wanted to, well, a2 is too dangerous. King b2, we just take the bishop. We have f5, a2, king b2, b3. This pawn's not vulnerable if there's no bishop c4. It'd take a long time to target this. So anyway, in this position, the final move, king b4. White resigns here. Yes, his king's getting uh, mated potentially as an example. I mean, say the bishop did want to try and come back and play something like bishop e6. But f7, it's just too, too late. Check. Let's say here, we just, we're going to squish the king with king a3. That would hold a2 for b2 to be checkmate. So it'd be a squish like this, for example, as an example. Yeah, <laughs> the opponent has to be given credit here. He played brilliantly the first 20 moves. Absolutely wonderful queen sack. Rook g2 from Tal did have a little downside, but it needed precision to pick up on that little downside. But what a what a fantastic game! 1959, a year before Tal became world chess champion, it shows some of his fellow Regans were also magicians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Comments, questions, likes appreciated. Thanks very much.